Hey, Sonia. Hey, Janos. You know what I really find fascinating? No. Monkeys. 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 Okay, tell me more. Bananas. No, no, this time it's not going to be bananas. There was an experiment. Okay, it's probably not true. As far as I, I could find on the internet, it's it's probably a thought experiment where they put a bunch of monkeys um, in a cage and they put a banana on a ladder. And every time a monkey would go up um, then to get the banana, then there would be a really, really cold shower. So after a while, apparently, according to this myth, the monkeys started beating each other when one wanted to go up and get the banana. And even when you started switching out the monkeys, the new monkey would then um, also be beaten when it tried to get the banana. So after a while, the, none of the original monkeys were there <laughs> and they beat each other when they tried to get the banana, but nobody knew why. Okay. <laughs> what does that have to do with honey pots? This is this is similar to this is um so this was actually in a psychology book okay and there is no uh, cited reference but it's it's kind of like a, a humanized thought experiment because that's how humans behave so I'm thinking that uh, this is similar to how we treat SSH because everybody says oh you should do this and that to secure your SSH but no nobody really knows why right. Uh huh. <laughs> Great analogy. <laughs> no, seriously, it's it's um you 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 have all these rules about SSH, but um you don't know what happens when you don't obey them. You don't know what happens when your SSH get gets hacked. And of course, on the one side, you know that really bad things happen because people gain access to your system and they steal all your data. But even when that happens, you don't have enough forensic data to analyze what really happened. You can just pick up the pieces and try and figure out what, what's going on. And this is how we get to the honeypot. Uh -huh. This is how we get to the honeypot, yes. <laughs> okay. So so SSH, like normal honeypots, you try and put up a web server or whatever and try to analyze the attacks, but SSH is really not all that um, well. I haven't really found many SSH honeypot projects. So yeah, one of the, one of the key pieces of of this project is, is actually SSH. So let's let's put the pieces together. How you basically created a whole SSH server. Don't don't beat me to the point. Okay, don't sorry, be, sorry, don't, sorry, don't sorry, beat sorry. me to the point. So so one one of the parts is is SSH. So you SSH into a server with a username and when you build a honeypot you usually want to allow any password to succeed. So you let everybody in and then you take a look what happens. Um, and then people can type commands like echo hello world, but usually that's not what an attacker would type. They would type something like this. So to, to kill the Apache web server or whatever they want to do. And we'll talk about the incentives to hack an SSH server a little later. Um, the other part of the, the puzzle is containers. So you know that you can run a container that's where you can type commands into. So why don't we put the two together? That was the basic idea behind behind creating an SSH server. But that's what you do anyway, right? You can SSH into a server, you can run your containers. So what's new about this? Well, so let's take a look how you would enforce that you have to be in a container because when you're in a container, that's a, a sort of a, it works like the the classic jails from the from the Unix world that it doesn't let you access anything. It just lets you access the things that are inside of a container. So the idea is that the user SSHs into the SSH server, and then we pick a container backend like Docker, Podman, or Kubernetes that we run the the shell that the user is running. We run that inside the container. Mm -hmm. And there is a there is a way to do this with with your classic SSH server, and there is a reason why there is a do not try this at home sign here. Okay, <laughs> it's a bad idea. Um, that's so the classic SSH server. There are a couple of SSH servers. Um, one of them, the most popular one, probably is OpenSSH, and OpenSSH has a feature called force command. So when you log in then it runs this command that you specify regardless of what the connecting user is asking to do. And you can set force command to do a Docker run Ubuntu so that the user lands in a container and they can't do anything about it. 
and this works. And you can even put, you know, the whole topic is we want to see what the user is doing. So you can even use Askinema to record the session and then you can replay it and let hilarity ensue of somebody trying to do something in a container. Mm -hmm. And this is how you do it. So if you want to try this yourself, um, good luck. Don't try this at home because it's, it's dangerous. I want to know what it looks like. You know what it looks like? Um, this is how it looks like. You SSH into, into this server. Um, you type your password for the user that exists on the host machine. And then you can see the Askinema output that it's starting to record whatever you're doing. And then you can do an Askinema play for the file that's been recorded. And it will replay you whatever the user did on that session. Mm -hmm. So this is the basic idea behind Askinema. You're just combining things. I want to see what it looks like. We'll get there. So there's another feature in SSH where you can... Type hello world? No, where you can run commands on the SSH server. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's different to launching a shell. Launching a shell is basically asking the server, hey, launch me the default shell. But it's also run me this command. And that's a bit tricky because um, of that part. That's, mm -hmm. that's then going to be ex executed. And we get an error because we haven't prepared our little force command to run this command that's been passed. And it's also not an interactive terminal. So when we start to fix this, we try and pass this SSH original command variable, which contains the thing that the user said they wanted to run to Docker run. Um, however, we can do shenanigans. This specifically is redirecting the output of this echo to yeah. a file. And this looks like, okay, this should run inside the container, except it doesn't. Because of how we constructed this, this is going to run, the redirection is going to run outside the container. So this means that, that the echo hello world is running inside the container and then the redirection happens outside so we can write into a file on the host system. You can prevent this if you're really, really good at shell scripting. <laughs> but you see why it's a bad idea. It's not. I see everyone who knows Perl really shine now. Yes, probably. So you can you can do a, a Perl script that that takes care of this, and um, and then hopefully you will not have a leak. The problem is that the force command command that the, the program that you're executing is running on the host machine, and if you mess it up, then. The, anything that you're running is, is running on the host machine. So there is, you have to make one mistake to expose your whole host machine. And also you need to create the users that you want to let in on your host machine. Yeah, we don't want that usually. Usually not, not, for, for, not, not, not for a honeypot. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, typically something where you would start thinking, okay, how can I do this? And of course you can go the classic Linux way and do a bunch of shell scripting and hope that nothing goes wrong. But generally, um, we have a better way. Let's get to it. Let's get, let's get to it. So there's this thing that we started a couple of months ago. It was early summer um, last year, and it's called Container SSH. And what it does, it's an SSH server that launches containers the same way that OpenSSH would without the whole shell scripting part. So same idea. User connects to container SSH and that talks directly to the API of Docker or Kubernetes or what have you. We added a couple of other things though. So one of the things is the authentication server. That's a webhook that container SSH sends to a component that you can run. And this webhook will send the username and the password of the user or the public key or any other credentials. So right now, one of the features that we're working on is the keyboard interactive authentication. And your server can say if we should let the user in or not. And basically, I mean, if you check out the website, there is an example implementation for an authentication server. Yes. But everyone is free to implement their own authentication server. So this can be used for enterprises as well as for small companies. And Yes, that's the, the general idea is that the we are thinking about providing an authentication server for basic use cases like 
here's a MySQL database, read the passwords from that, or, um, or right now the keyboard interactive is really interesting because um, we're looking into implementing OAuth, so basically single sign-on, and the authors of various SSH clients have been very helpful. They have um, helped us make this use case happen by making the links clickable and the message, etc. But the basic idea is that, that this is pluggable, so you can just come up Replace with Replace your, your own authentication server with whatever and still use container SSH in a useful way. Yes, and the protocol is really simple. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll show that a little later. The other thing that you can do with it is... A configuration server. And the configuration server can be used to dynamically configure what kind of containers to launch. So that's, again, a webhook. And you can create an application that gives back a per user configuration, what kind of container image to run or what kind of volumes to mount, etc. So to do this, you create a YAML file because every configuration nowadays has, has to be in YAML. And you specify that you want to do audit logging. And audit logging is a new feature in the container SSH 04 release. And for hilarity, you can specify the Askino format and tell it which directory to store it in. Yeah, but don't do that. <laughs> not unless you want Askinema videos yes, to show. So it's not it's not something that you would want to use for enterprise grade audit logging, but let's 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 uh, see why not. You specify a um, host key. You can take this from OpenSSH if you want, or you can generate it yourself. We'll show you in a minute how to do that. And you specify the authentication server. And again, we're supplying a demo authentication server with container SSH that you can use for, for this purpose. Um, but generally the idea is that you should specify, you, could, you should bring your own authentication server. Um, you can generate the keys with SSH keygen. And then you can launch container SSH. And then this is going to happen. When somebody logs in, then container SSH will send a post request to slash password on your authentication server with a JSON in it, username, password in base64, because you know there might be special characters. Do you know anyone who's using those in their passwords and regularly runs into systems yeah, problems? Yes, you. <laughs> yes, and you as well. So whenever we type special characters, random websites just break. So in this case, we base 64 the password, so you can no, check. No, no, no. The best is when you type a password and they just omit the special characters. So you think you typed your password correctly, but they just don't take it. And then you just right. forget the special characters and suddenly the password works. Right. That's that's the best one. Anyway, so so for, with container <laughs> SSH, you get your password in base64, and you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, you get the IP address of the connecting user, always useful for logging, and you get a connection ID. The connection ID is an ID we are generating, and it is it is the same connection ID that you get in your audit log, in your authentication server, in the configuration server. So you can use that to match up uh, various logs. When are we showing the Ask Kinema replay? In a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so what you have to send back is this. You send back success true to let the user in and success false to deny entry. There so we he, go. <laughs> there we go. Here's the Ask Kinema part. So um, about Ask Kinema, let's take a look what happens when you log into container SSH. So here you can see me typing something into a console and this is this is already the replay. So this is a, an ASCII file, an ASCII cast file that we are replaying here. And this is how it looks. The format is rather simple. So there is an ASCII cast v1 format, which you shouldn't use. And an ASCII cast v2 format, which is the one that you should use. So the ASCII cast v2 format starts with, uh, the ASCII cast v2 format is a new line delimited JSON. So it's not a JSON file. It's several JSONs and one JSON is one line. So you basically, you 
um, have one JSON in each line, and this is the header. So For each, wait, so what uh, each command that the user types in is its own JSON? Yes, basically okay. that's mm -hmm. what it is. So what you have here is the header. You specify how big the terminal is for the for the playback. You uh, specify the starting timestamp so that ASCII Nema knows how, uh, when to type the commands. So each the the typing that you saw before is is timestamped, and that's how ASCII Nema knows how to replay the whole session. And then the consecutive lines are just JSON arrays, and you can see the first character, the first entry in this array is a timestamp, so that's the offset to the starting time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second one is if it's input or output, so you can record input as well, so hidden passwords, etc. But normally, you in an ASCII cast file, you only have output. And then you have the the terminal encoded output uh, that happened on a terminal. So for example, in this case, uh, a colored hello world. I, I believe this text should be read from the from the color codes that are there. And this is what Askinema replace. Um, okay, cool. So we got our Askinema. Let's watch our hackers, right? Yeah, let's 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 get to the point. Let's let's watch some hackers. So we deployed an early version of this. And um, yeah, so this happened. Hmm. So they just tried to hack into the, the username. Yeah, they tried to <coughs> change the password, etc. But you can see this doesn't look like a terminal, right? No. The problem is that whenever most hacking attempts nowadays are not somebody going there and typing at your console, they're bots. So they will not request an interactive terminal. And Askinema is made exclusively for interactive terminals where people are typing something. So the format doesn't really log the things that we want to look at. Um, so it's not, it's not an audit logging format and you can't really use it to record things that bots are doing. And at the end, we'll show a couple of examples that we found that are really, really astonishing of what the bots are actually doing um, and, and why Askinema is not suitable for this. So once we realized this, we came up with a second logging format, the binary format that just logs everything. Well, that was the actual plan, and we just came up with Askinema, I think, because someone asked for it jokingly. So you were like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> yes, that's true. But I was for a while, I was seriously considering Askinema as a, as a way to log things mm -hmm. because it, I mean, it's a format that already exists. There I mean, the a, new line, the limited JSON is a good way to That's That's to a really good way, anyway. yeah. Because, because the, the problem with, with logging everything in a single JSON is that you need to buffer everything in memory. Yeah, exactly. New line, the limited JSON is, is much better because you just need to buffer one line. Um, so the, a schema player would have been really nice to, to show what, you, what the hackers are doing. But uh, as we put it online, we realized that we can basically not use the Askinema replay for anything really useful. So binary logging is is different. You can change the um, the audit log format to binary, and that's going to log in a rather complex binary format, which we provide a decoder for. Um, and again, you can log into a directory and then do the rest of the configuration file. So when you log in binary, this is, uh, and you decode it afterwards because this is already the new line delimited JSON decoded format, you see this. Um, what this is, is first of all, all the commands that have been typed or any data that has been streamed is base64 encoded. And we will see in a moment why. And second, we record the things that are not visible in a schema. For example, when the terminal is resized, or when non-interactive sessions are happening. Um, so the other thing that we can do and that we did for, for audit logging is uh, uploading the data. But let's take a look at the, the data format. So you have an SSH connection and you assume that it's one connection, you type into it and that's it. But actually there are multiple channels. So for example, you could open one channel to type something interactively and on the second channel, start an SFTP upload, etc. So those are the things that we are logging. Let's take a look at a couple of interesting bits. This is fairly simple. It's a program execution. So basically the connecting user requested 
to run this specific program. This is cat proc. So basically, the attacker was taking a look at what kind of a CPU we're running, or I don't I don't know what the purpose behind this is. The second thing is that uh, that we found a lot is SFTP uploads. So it's no longer the case that they're basically just typing the 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 malware that they're trying to run. They want to upload the malware directly. Yeah, they want to upload the malware directly. And then, you know, there it's a tar file, so they untar it, and then they remove the tar file, so there are no traces left of uh, of what's going on. So it's really, really involved. And they're doing this in a single SSH connection with multiple sessions. So without container SSH, how does audit logging work normally? Um, usually you use force command to run something that's doing the audit logging. Okay, so there are other systems. There are other systems that can do this. There are audit logging um, programs, but as we saw with the force command thing, you have to be really conscious of, of, of potential security holes. So the developers of these tools have to pay a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And it is not necessarily, they cannot necessarily correlate um, connecting users that are running in the, uh, that are running multiple shells. They cannot necessarily correlate these connections together. But so basically, if I as a standard single user just have my server up and don't secure my SSH, anyone can come in and I don't even know what they're doing. Maybe um, maybe fail to ban bans them if they connect too many times or whatever. But that's basically it. I don't have any overview of what they're doing. Well, I mean, if if you have a weak password, um, mm -hmm. then yes, that is the case. So I've seen recently, I've seen a case where somebody set the username test user and the password <laughs> test, and it took about it took about twenty minutes for that server to be hacked. It was a honeypot, right? Um, no, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay. So so anyway, yes. So it, it it's really quick. You, your SSH servers get hacked real quick, and then we ended up having to perform an analysis on the on the on the virtual machine image to figure out what the attacker did because most of the stuff was gone already. So the approach of actually uploading things and then untarring them and deleting the tar would work if there was no audit logging. That would potentially work, yes. Hmm. Or or you'd have to painstakingly go through the audit log. But if the attacker gained root privileges, then they might be able to delete the audit log. So I'm not uh, I have looked at some of these facilities, but I haven't looked into their capabilities. So you can produce a fully viable audit log using force command, but you have to be really, really, really careful to configure your SSH server appropriately so that you don't have a security hole. Mm -hmm. And if you just don't allow people to SSH other than into containers, this is not an issue. Um, so containers are not 100% secure. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, you shouldn't run untrusted workloads in containers. But one of the things that container SSH can do, for example, it can connect to a remote container backend. So you can run the SSH server on a different server, a different physical machine, if you will, than where your container backend is running. And you can drop your users into a network disconnected container. No, that's interesting. Yeah, so because we are interacting with the container API, it is basically a standard input output thing. So it's mm -hmm. a program that's running, but the program can be in a network disconnected environment. So SFTP would still work, but when they try to attack somebody else, that would not. You can do the same in, in Linux again. Mm -hmm. You can use firewalls, you can do all kinds of stuff, but it is going to be very tricky. So I found one more thing that's re that was really, really interesting. Which was? Want to guess what kind of an attack it was? Um, someone tried to send you an email and spam you with free ebooks. Spamming, yes. Email, no. It was this. So what the attacker was <laughs> looking for is a mobile device, so a mobile phone. Um, they try, basically what this is. They're trying to send SMS, spam SMS. And the reason why they're doing this is because getting a new mobile number is expensive and the network providers that allow spam SMS usually get blocked really quickly. So what they're trying to do is try to find mobile phones that are connected to servers, which is a, which has been a popular way of, of doing alerting with Nagios or 
whatever what what have you to just send a sysadmins and uh, a short a text message that hey your service is down and since sms service used to be really expensive or you want a really reliable way what you do is you just put a mobile phone on top of your server and you just plug it in using usb <laughs> And this is what this malware was trying to use. And this brings us into um, the, the motivation. Like, why would you hack a server? Well, there has to be some sort of an incentive because you're going through, uh, through a lot of effort to, to writing, uh, writing these malwares, etc. So there has to be a commercial incentive. And one of the commercial incentives is sending spam SMS. So what you do, you build a, a botnet that is just spamming out text messages from monitoring... Uh, phones and you would probably not even realize this as a sysadmin because there's something running if you're not looking at it if you're not looking at the audit logs and your phone bill is paid by the company i mean who the hell's looking at their phone bill nowadays mm. you just you just see maybe okay then they're gonna tell you hey why is your phone bill 200 dollars but i mean that takes a while right mm -hmm. So this is what happens when you let people in your SSH server. So SSH attacks have become really sophisticated. It's not like in the good old days where, where an attacker would upload a Perl script and then just run that Perl script. These are really trying to make use of only the basic tools and they're trying to upload their own payload. They're static. Some of the payloads are, are statically linked, so they, they're maybe written in Go or they're written in C, but they're statically linked so they can run without any additional dependencies. They're using multiple channels within a single SSH session to make sure that uh, the connection doesn't break or, or they don't end up somewhere else. So they're trying to really keep a low profile when attacking SSH servers. So that brings us to security. So the basic rule, of course, when you run an SSH server, yes. change your SSH port been the same 15 years ago it's the same now it's the same now but a lot of people don't do it and when you change your ssh port to anything but 22 or 2222 22, you will receive only a fraction of the attacks or you could just not use passwords old rule old rule use ssh keys you can disable password authentication in open ssh really easy do it use ssh keys don't use passwords Use strong keys. I mean, this is, um, you will probably not get hacked if you use a weak key, but if you're, if you have a strong key, the chances are Even much lower. less. Yeah. So the other thing is just don't use usernames that, uh, hackers are using root test admin, etc. Those are usernames that an attack is going to try. And if you have a weak password for whatever reason, then they're going to get in. So just simply not using usernames like that is going to lower your attack surface. The other thing is, is and this goes into the direction of targeted attacks when somebody wants to hack your company, is when you wanted to attack a, let's say a web shop, how would you do it? Would you go for the servers where everybody's paying attention? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course, right? It's like everybody's is 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 running head in head on into the firewall, right? Mm -hmm. No. You would use you would probably look at at trying to hack a developer laptop where there But those are unhackable. Everyone takes care of those and pays attention and everyone's laptop is encrypted. What are you talking? <laughs> yes, and nobody nobody is running untrusted no. and npm modules no, on never. it, etc. No. And 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 containers off the internet because somebody said it's good, right? Yes, and this doesn't happen. What are you suggesting? Yes, the the thing is that you're when you're a developer, you are more or less running untrusted code. When you're um, downloading a library there might be a script included that's running automatically when you're running containers yes it's running in a container but maybe not as secure as they should be etc and one of the low-hanging fruits is trying to look for your ssh private keys and if you don't use key passwords then your key is essentially unprotected so a payload that's hidden inside of a popular library could steal your um your ssh key so use a password like test yeah 
the funny thing is even if you use a password like test on your SSH key, it's going to be better than not using a password at all. But ideally, you would use some, some long sentence for your SSH key. And then you can use an SSH agent to not have to type the password all the time because the attackers are unlikely to run attacks directly from your laptop because that's going to raise suspicion. They're probably going to take the key and, and try and run it from somewhere else. If you want to be even more secure, you could just use hardware tokens like a YubiKey and you can put your SSH key on there. And then every time you want to log in, your YubiKey starts blinking and you have to tap the YubiKey physically to use the key. And the last one, which nobody ever does, running security updates. The thing is... See, that's the nice thing about automatic updates. Yes. Automatic updates are great. So Especially on immutable operating systems. That's <laughs> your topic, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So, so running security updates is really, really important. And if you can enable security updates, my experience is that you really need to run them weekly. There is something coming up almost every week. If it's your SSH server or some other library, you really don't want to be left in a position where not having applied your security update is, is going to cause a, a problem on your system. And yes, it's painful. So as a sysadmin, that is really a hassle and you need to think about how are you going to do that? And as Sanya mentioned, immutable operating systems, the concept of immutable infrastructure really helps with this. So apart from audit logging, which is really fun to watch, and then you left with gigabytes of data and hours and hours and days and months to, to analyze what your honeypot did, what can you do with this? Any thoughts? Mm teach about how to secure systems by showing audit logs? That's one option, of course. The other option that was the original reason why, why I, I wrote the prototype of this years ago. Um, it was written in Java and it wasn't all that great. So there's a Java library that implements SSH and it's called Apache Mina. And Apache Mina implements an SSH server. The problem was that the I, I used Docker at the time and the Docker libraries available for Java did not work well with the Apache Mina. There's a there's an async IO library in Apache Mina and there's an async IO library in the Docker client and the two were incompatible. So it worked. But when a, a customer wanted to download large amounts of data, then it would get buffered in memory and the SSH server would run out of memory. Sounds good. Yeah, so not all that great. Internal DDoS. Internal DDoS, kind of, yes. And then customers complain, oh, our SSH server doesn't work. Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the, the basic problem of, of web hosting typically is that when you want to have an advanced permission matrix, so we have a bunch of websites and then different users should be able to access different websites because Linux the Linux permission system is, is rather basic. And of course you have ACLs, but setting those are, uh, is problematic and there are various tools that then forget to set them or actively unset them. So then user A creates something and then user B can't access it, et cetera, et cetera. So using containers to work around that problem where every user has the same user ID, so the same numeric user ID, but the folders are mounted into containers dynamically is, is one of the use cases that was the earliest for this prototype. And this is one of the um, use cases that appeared in, in people who are using container SSH to give people access to websites and, and give them tools like, um, for example, with uh, in, in one of the cases, it's, it's a Drupal website. So there's this utility called Drush, which is the Drupal shell. And it's already there in the container and they can use it and it's dynamically provisioned for the website that the user is trying to access. The other uh, option, of course, is Linux learning environments because you create the containers dynamically and when the user disconnects, then the container is removed as well. So it's not like you then need to clean up after your students. 
um, you can just simply let them in there and it will run as long as the user needs them. You can mount volumes for, for persistent data, but generally the container is deleted when the user disconnects. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and later on we plan add, to add features that let a user keep the container or stop the container, etc. So there are many things that we want to add to this, but right now the containers are removed when the user disconnects. And the third thing is a high security environment. As we mentioned before, the audit logs are uh, can be automatically uploaded to an S3 compatible object storage. So they're not stored locally. And Which means no attacker can delete them and they can't be modified or anything else. With an asterisk. Yeah. So S3 does not allow streaming data mm -hmm. because you have to finalize the Yeah, upload. so you upload it in bulk. So if you in that time in someone deletes it, it's... Yes. Yeah. So, but the the um, the upload is so so it uploads in five megabytes chunks, mm -hmm. and you need to finalize the upload to um, to finish it. And um, what do you but mean? To finalize the upload. So when the user disconnects, then we then we need to tell um, the S three object storage that it that the upload is complete and uh -huh. it can actually create a file. And from that point on. The object storage, there is a feature that some S3 compatible object storages support, which is object locking, so that nobody, not even you, can delete that file. You can only delete the whole bucket. No, not even that. You have, If you set a time, um, this is called a, a warm storage. It's, it's, it's typically used for, um, for when you have to ensure that data is retained for a certain period of time, then you use a warm storage. Um, it's called write once read many mm -hmm. and then you can upload a file and it cannot be deleted for the time that uh, that, that is that you, is set okay. for example three years or one year or six months or whatever and then no attacker can can delete it and this is usually done for compliance reasons you can use this for invoices you can use this for audit logs whatever you need to do to um to to stay compliant with whatever rules you need to stay compliant with and then, of course, the container backend can run on a completely different server, which is an additional security measure. So even when the container gets breached, your audit logs in your SSH server um, stay where they are and you have the ability to analyze what happened. Um, and one of the use cases that we saw in, uh, in one company using this is they did something where they needed to provide access to their people um, for their people to customer environments. And the way that they did this is they dynamically provisioned containers and of course enable whatever logging they enabled. I don't have the details, but the idea was that in the username, the person who needed to connect could specify which environment they needed to connect to. So for example, they could do their user at customer name in the username. And then that's how they connected to that environment and everything was logged and they know that this person connected that environment. So, um, and they locked it down so only a specific command could be run, uh, etc. So it's, um, it's done in a way that can, is, that's easily traceable and they cannot use SFTP to transport things out, etc. etc. So there, there are many things there that, um, that have been added to provide a high security environment. So if you want to learn more about container SSH, you can go to containerssh.io or debugged it. <laughs> <laughs> debugged it. Yes. So if you want to if you want to read more from us various topics, then you can go to debugged.it. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and we are hoping for your questions. Thank you. Bye.